Welcome into Plead Your Case, WCTV's only national sports debate show. I'm Austin Bechtold. Today I'll be joined by Carter Newcomb and Kaylin Elliott to discuss if college athletes should be paid or not. We'll also get into who the biggest busts are in the history of the National Football League and break it down. Sidney Crosby of the Pittsburgh Penguins or Alex Ovechkin of the Washington Capitals. Who is the better player and who has had the better career? So sit back and relax because it is time to watch us plead our case. NIL and college athletes receiving money while they are participating for some of the biggest brands in college football, college basketball, and other sports is drawing national attention as NIL continues to captivate college audiences. Kaylin, I want to first start with you. Do you think that college athletes flat out just in general should be paid? You know, I do think they should. There are big rewards from the NIL, but there is also an amount of great risk because after the NCAA lost in court, everything is done by a state by state basis. So we've seen a loss of, you know, regulation because the NCAA doesn't regulate it nationally. So each day kind of goes on their own, which can lead athletes to fall into more holes. I mean, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a difficult subject because what regulation really is there at this point from the NCAA? It's very new and a not too thorough process, at least at this point. Yeah, well, really what it's doing is it's making the transfer portal an absolute madhouse, Austin. You saw a guy like Jordan Addison left Pitt to go to Los Angeles, California to play for USC. Uh, you're going to see a lot of that. And since, since really, you know, the NIL deals have taken over college sports, you know, one guy's going here, one guy's going there. It just seems like every single year, as soon as the season ends, whether it be football, basketball, heck, even baseball, you see on transfer, they're going transfer portal, transfer portal, transfer portal. And a lot of that's to be able to make some of their own money. It is. And when you truly think about it, also adding a fifth year because of COVID eligibility. There are coaches that are going, Brian Kelly left Notre Dame. He went to LSU, Lincoln Riley going from Oklahoma to USC where Addison went as well. Kaylin, do you think that this in general is a problem for the NCAA? Because part of the argument is if the coaches can leave and have flexibility to go wherever they want, shouldn't the players as well? I mean, I think it will be a problem. Just like Carter said, that transfer portal is a hot mess. And, you know, there's a lot that rides on the, these students' backs because a lot of these students are taking these NIA deals and moving to states where the regulations are a little bit looser because now it's legal because they want to provide housing or income for their family. There's a lot more to it that we don't see. I want to put the word out there that I, I, I think that the athletes should be paid. Uh, they, they should be making these NIL deals. And I say, I mean, I, don't, I can't blame the kid. Go, go make my, I'm in college. I understand I'm broke. I'm sure some of these guys are also broke. The NCAA makes so much money off of these guys. I mean, think about the final four. I mean, look at the arenas they're able to play and look how many people watch on CBS, TBS, you know, all the, all the networks. I mean, the, the NCAA makes so much money off these guys. So why not be able to make a penny, you know, at college, you know, with your name? Now, is this, Carter, you played football at Waynesburg for three years. Is this something that you think could only exist at the Division One level, or could we see a trickle-down effect to D2 and D3? Well, I mean, I'll put it this way. As someone who did play Division Three athletics and still does, uh, I think the, it should trickle down regardless. Obviously, Division Two and Division Three athletes probably won't make as much because, well, they don't have the TV time and, you know, they don't have as big of a presence on social media. But, you know, even someone like myself, I currently do have an NIL deal. And I know that, you know, I haven't got you know, much off of that. But just to have that for some other Division Two, and Division Three athletes, it could be a big thing. You know, some money here or there goes a long way. Kayla, how much further do you think this whole entire process could go and change? You know, I do think it is going to go a lot further. Currently, LifeWallet CEO John Ruiz, a University of Miami booster, has earmarked $10 million to the University of Miami's football program. Like, that is a huge amount of money, and I, don't, I only think that it could go up from there. And at the same time, it also raises the question, and a lot of people have mentioned, you get a scholarship to go and play athletics, especially high-level Division One. If you're at Miami and you're playing football, you're playing basketball, you're running track, whatever it might be, you're getting school paid for you. And it used to be, was that enough? Was having school paid for you, uh, free education and free tuition, enough to be able to satisfy it? And it seems like now, Carter, 
that's obviously not the case anymore. And it just seems like everybody's wanting more. And for the players, especially if you look at, let's just take some college football guys like Bryce Young at Alabama or your C.J. Stroud at Ohio State, top-notch quarterbacks or any skill position players, even on the defensive side, you're making, you have the ability to make a ton of money no matter where you're at. And it seems like just combine everything in, like kind of how you mentioned, the money pit just continues to add up. You know, when you look at like the money factor for these guys, I mean, you say, oh, well, they're, they're already getting a free scholarship, so why would they need more? I mean, think about it like this. I mean, you're at your job and, and they bring in so much money off of something. You're, you're, you feel like you're undervalued for how much you can bleed, you know, for your company. It's kind of the same way because in general, it's the same reason why professional athletes are paid as much as they are because sports is the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest forms of entertainment. That, that's where the money comes from. It comes from television. It comes from commercials and ad revenue. That's where all the money that the NCAA makes off these guys. So as an athlete, yeah, I would probably want as much as I you know put out and, and you know bring in money wise for the NCAA, I would want to make more as well. Kaylin, do you have any other thoughts? On the I mean, topic? I agree with Carter on that thought. We also have to think about the fact that these college athletes are playing at a level that is very close to pro sports, especially in the Division One level. Um, you know, they're liable for injuries and. In a league like the NFL, you're also liable for injuries. So why aren't these players getting compensated? I, I agree. I think it's really beneficial for the athletes to be able to take advantage of these opportunities that are presented to them. Even athletes like we see in gymnastics, Libby Dunn's making what two million dollars off NIL deals, something like that. <laughs> there, uh, there is just especially. I think it's Kaylin helping women's sports as well to be able to get a lot more recognition, which is a great yeah. thing. Carter, any final thoughts? Look, I think when you look at it this way, you know, these, these players, you know, they, from the time they're young, they're, they're four or five years old, they're in the gym, they're practicing every single day, they're doing everything they need to do. They deserve the money they're getting. Look, I, some of us, you know, we weren't in the gym on, on Saturday morning starting AAU tournaments at 6 a.m. all day Sunday. Some of us went home, we watched cartoons on Saturday morning. So, yes, these guys deserve the money they're getting. Great stuff, guys, and when we come back, we will move from the collegiate levels to the pro level and talk about the biggest bust of all time in the National Football League. When we return here on Please Your Case. This is producer Caleb Yager, and you are watching The Buzz. Welcome back to the Pick'em segment here on Plead Your Case. I'll be your host for this segment, Logan Lefiscopo. This week, we have two new competitors, Spencer Frateri, Mike Saliba, giving Ryan Martin a break to have our first semester championship, as we would say here on Plead Your Case. We're going to go through the picks for week 13 of the NFL season. And Spencer, being that you are the most wing winningest excuse me, of this segment, we're going to start with you Thursday night, Bills and Patriots. Well, I just want to start out by saying uh, I don't see Colin Rhodes anywhere, so let's get out, out the way. Um, Bills, Pats, um, I think it's easily Bills Mafia. Give me Joshy Allen. Um, I don't really think the Patriots defense stands a chance. I'm going with the Bills. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you here. Um, it's just pure principle that the Bills have been just steamrolling competition. You know, they had a couple losses where it seems like that they – Weren't in the game the whole time Josh Allen made a couple of mistakes, but uh, beating up on the lines on Thanksgiving like every team does for the last 40 years is kind of a easy game to kind of start picking up for the playoffs here. So I'm going to go with the Bills. In our next game, opening our Sunday slate, the Steelers, you're representing Big Ben. And they're taking on the Atlanta Falcons in Atlanta. Spencer, who are you picking in this game? Well, as much as I'm rooting for Marcus Mariota to, to somehow pull off a win, um, I just don't – there's no offense. I'm, Drake London has had a really upsetting year, and George Pickens is thriving the Steelers' offense. So I'm going to go ahead and give the Steelers a win here. It's interesting that you said someone's thriving in the Steelers' offense because Matt Canada has been absolutely <laughs> abysmal with the play calling. Uh, Colts players were yelling out, oh, we know the plays, we know the plays. So it's like at this point – Come on, switch it up a little bit. But this offense has started to really get a uh, motion as to what they want to do. You know, they have a really good wide receiver core. The running backs are playing really well. Kenny Pickett's starting to get into form. 
So I'm going to have to go with the Steelers for sure. So our next game Sunday, an NFC North matchup, Green Bay Packers, Chicago Bears, two teams that we're kind of uncertain as of right now what the quarterback situation will be. Spencer, who are you picking in this game? I, I want to say that if Justin Fields was for sure playing, which we don't know yet, obviously I would take the Bears without a doubt. But, I mean, Jordan Love, he showed some potential at the end of that Eagles game. Um, with that being said, Christian Watson's having a really good year. He had a rough start to his year, but after the you know first five or six games right the way, he's been real special. So I'll take the Packers, but that's a game that could go either way. And this is going to be our first disagreement. I'm going to have to pick the uh, Chicago Bears on this one. Um, once again, I think... David Montgomery, I said this the first time I was on the show, I think he's a really solid running back that can really get the Bears' offense going uh, whenever they allow him to get the yards. Um, if Justin Fields plays, obviously I think that's going to be an easy game for them after we just watched you know, how perfect almost he's been playing. You know, If the defense can hold up a little bit, I think the Bears can pull it out. In our next game, about between two cats, we got the Jacksonville Jaguars coming off a big upset over the Baltimore Ravens. And then we had the Detroit Lions, who have been okay this year, about what we expect. But, Spencer, who are you taking out of them? Well, I'm taking ja the Jaguars. And I'm picking the Jaguars solely because I am just so upset that I just even had the thought of drafting DeAndre Swift. Because what an awful year he has. I, I mean, I can't. how long can a shoulder injury possibly last? I, just, I don't want the Lions to win. I hope he doesn't do good. I don't even care if I lose in my fantasy league. Give me the man with the long hair. I'll take the Jags. It's actually funny that you say that about Swift because I drafted him and traded him for St. Brown and Jamal Williams. That's so it's paid off perfectly for me. And with that being said, Jamal Williams has, I think, 13 touchdowns on the year as a backup running back. I mean, he's played absolutely insane. Uh, once again, it's with the run game. If he can get going, the rest of the offense can get going. I think I'm going to pick Detroit in this one. I think that, you know, coming off a tough Thanksgiving loss like they do every 40 years here, uh, every year. I think that they can bounce back on this one. So our next game, I feel like I know where you two are going to go with this one. A Mike White-led New York Jets team versus a Minnesota Vikings team that has been red hot. Spencer, who are we taking in this game? Mike, I think you know who we got to go with. I think we, we know who we're going go with. With the Vikings and Jay Jetta, baby. We're taking the Vikings. All day long. All day long, baby. Jay Jetta is going to torch Sauce Gardner. I, we talked about it before the show. Sauce Gardner likes to P.I. a lot on these plays. Um, I think Jay Jettas has played out of his mind. Uh, Dalvin Cook is top five running back. Captain Kirk has absolutely played out of his mind. I see you shaking your head. Josh Jacobs is an even top ten. Okay. Um, so we'll just move on to the next game here. Yeah, so. we're not here to debate who's a top five, top three running back. <clears throat> Josh Jacobs. Um, next game, we have NFC East matchup by two teams that have been rather surprising this year. Washington Commanders, New York Jets. Spencer, who are you taking? Taylor Heineke, like you, you mentioned, they've been playing well. Um, Heineke's been playing really well, and it's good to see that he's had a real interesting way through the NFL. But with that being said, you know, Giants lose on Thanksgiving in a close one. I think Daniel Jones, Saquon, they come back. I think this is, should be an easier game. They got the home crowd. I'll take the Giants in this one. I'm going to have to disagree with you on this one. Uh, I think the football team's really – not the football team. Sorry, the commanders. It's weird once again that, you know, we've gone through so many name switches. I think the commanders can pull this one out. Um, Robinson has been playing really good on the ground. Terry McLaurin and Curtis Samuel and Jahan Dotson are playing really well. Now they have Taylor Heineke, someone who's playing competent quarterback for the uh, commanders. You know, they had Carson Wentz, who was kind of a little bit iffy, was, was showing flashes of his past, but at the same time showing who he is now. Um, so I think the uh, commanders are going to pull this one out. Not easily, but they're going to do it. Our next game, two teams that heavily rely on their running game. Tennessee Titans, Philadelphia Eagles, King Henry, Jalen Hurts. Spencer, who are you taking? I was really disappointed with King Henry's play last week. He would have had a, a huge game if he had not, you know, he had that little catch and then he ran it for like, what, 60 yards, but then was fumbled right in the end zone. But I've been saying it all year. I'm riding with this as like my second team. I'm shouting out my guy, Shane. Go Birds, baby. I think the Eagles are winning this game. Last time I was on the show, I said the same two words as for this pick, and it's simple as this. Go Birds. Go Birds it is. Next game we have another bird hosting the Denver Broncos, the Baltimore Ravens. I think this one's pretty clear cut who's winning this one, but Spencer, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just tired. I'm, I'm just <laughs> completely tired of watching Russell, West, Russell Wilson excuse me, play football. And, I mean, I picked the Broncos in one of my – 
money league drafts and they played awful. So with that being said, I, I hope the Ravens blow out the Broncos by like 50. Broncos country, let's cry. It's been a really rough ride for them. Um, you know, you see the defense starting to yell at Russell Wilson. You never want to see that happen on an NFL team. The chemistry is absolutely destroyed. Nathaniel Hackett it might be a worse coach than uh, Matt Canada. I think I would trust Matt Canada more to call plays than Nathaniel Hackett at this point. Uh, but I'm just going to – I mean, it's obvious as to who I'm picking. The Ravens are going to just steamroll the Broncos. In our next game, Spencer, I know this one is near and dear to your heart. The Cleveland Browns at the Houston Texans. Who are you taking, Spence? <sighs> I'm taking the Texans. No, I have been waiting for this moment all year. I've been watching NFL football for the entire year so far. You know who I'm going to take. You know who's back. I'm taking the GOAT, Deshaun Watson. He's going to hit the air guitar all day long. He's going for 400 passing yards, four tutties. He's going to do it all in Houston. Anyone watching, it's going to be a great game. Deshaun Watson, the Browns, easy win. You're delusional. I you are not. delusional. I mean, it's his first game back. He's practiced for a week with this team. You can't just plug a quarterback in who's had absolutely no practice with the team all year and just expect, oh, we're going to throw for 400 yards and four touchdowns. It's not going to happen. Do I think the Browns are going to win? No, they're not. The Texans are going to play spoil to Deshaun Watson's return. It's like, it's I'm not going to say it's rigged, but it's a storyline. Oh, Deshaun Watson returns against the Texans. Obviously, that was going to happen. Everybody's going to expect that he wins this game. No. The Texans are going to beat them by at least 15. Delusional take. By 15. Oh, my. That's delusional saying they're going to win by nope. 15. Delusional take. But to open our 4 o'clock window now, battle of the NFC West teams, a surprising Seattle Seahawks led by Geno Smith and a very Super Bowl hungover LA Rams. Spencer, who are you picking? Yeah, the Rams stink, plain and simple. So, And Geno Smith's been having quite the year, so I'll go with the Seahawks here. I think it's pretty easily. We don't know if Matt Stafford will play. No Cooper Cup. The Rams stink. Yeah, I'm mean, going to agree with you there. Um, the Seahawks have been playing really well, and I think it's time that Geno Smith gets a new name. We're going to call him Heno Smith because he's him. Anyways, our next game that we have, Miami Dolphins, San Francisco 49ers. I'm going to label this as game of the week. I think, Spencer, you'll agree. I see you nodding your head. Who are you picking in this yeah, one? Yeah, I completely agree. This is without a doubt. There are some other good games, but this is the game of the week. And it's, it'll be, it should be a good one. I'm hoping it's a good one. With that being said, I want the young QB of Tua. I want that elite, I think, the best wide receiver duo in all football of Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. I like that little trio they've got going over there in Miami. Give me the fins. Um, I'm going to agree with you on this one. The Finns have been playing really well uh, on both sides of the ball all year long. Obviously, their offense has been the one that's kind of shown the potential, but their defense has started to step into their form. Uh, once again, I, they're one of those teams that I can see ending up winning their division for sure. You know, I don't think Buffalo is going to end up squeaking past them because I think that they could just pull it out at the end of the year here. Um, I, I think the Dolphins can make it the whole way to the AFC Championship, so... Uh, give me the Dolphins here. I think that's a little bit of a bold take okay. going along with your Houston Texans take, but we'll move on to a playoff matchup that we had this past postseason. Kansas City Chiefs, Cincinnati Bengals. Spencer, who are you going to take in this game? Well, I'm from Cleveland, and I like the Browns, not the Bengals or the Bungles or the Bumgles, whatever you want to call them. I'm going with the MVP front runner. I'm going with Patty Mahomes. I think him and Travis Kelsey are probably one of the best duos in football right now. I want to say this confidently and you know what I will I think it's an easy win for the Chiefs in Cincinnati I don't know if easy is the way to put it you know you've watched the Bengals beat the Chiefs last year what was it twice or was it just once uh, all I know is they won in it the postseason it was either, that's what hey, matters. they won they won whenever it mattered so you know it's going to be a close game once again and I think it's going to once again come down to Evan McPherson's foot um you know Last second field goal, it's happened once, it'll happen again. So, you know, story writes itself, basically. So we got, we've had a ton of differences so far. Maybe we'll have a couple more. Three games left, our last four o'clock game. You guys already know my guy, Josh Jacobs, with a career day against the Seattle Seahawks last week. Over 300 total yards. 
He's coming in, playing the Chargers at home. I know you're tired of me talking about him, Spencer. I know you're tired of it, Mike. But let me have my four-win team moment, okay? Josh Jacobs facing a weak Chargers defense. Spencer, who are you picking? Well, after you went on that lame rant, um, unfortunately, I'm taking the Raiders. But I just have no energy to express my enthusiasm picking the Raiders now. I was going to just simply mention that Josh Jacobs is playing pretty well right now. But, I mean, I think it's going to come down to Devontae because Devontae is Devontae. And I just think the Chargers aren't going to win this week. We go back to last time they were in Las Vegas, that classic Week 18 game last year. I think the Raiders got it easily, but not because of Josh Jacobs. I, that was that was painful to watch, to be honest with you. Um, I'm going to go with the Chargers. I, you know, I had a couple things that I wanted to say, but it all left my mind yeah. the second I heard all of that. So, well, um, okay, we'll just <laughs> we're just going to move on. We're, we'll pretend that never happened. You'll see it, but we're going to pretend it didn't happen. Sunday Night Football, Colts, Cowboys. Spencer, who are you taking? I think it's pretty easy. I mean, the Colts just lost to the Steelers somehow. I don't know how you lose to the Steelers. But anyways, I'm going with Dak and the Cowboys. Um, Mike, before the show, said this is their year. I think that's another delusional take. They're playing well, but I don't think they have any shot in the Super Bowl this year. I don't really know how far they're going to go in the playoffs. With that being said, I will take them this week. They're in Dallas, Sunday night game. Give me the Cowboys. Well, it's kind of interesting that you bring up the Steelers winning a game, considering they've done it so much against the Browns in the, you know. Sorry, I couldn't forget. Who won years. this year? Oh, that's crazy. Um, here comes the pass. Just this year? Here comes the pass. Last time I checked, Ben Roethlisberger's like maybe 27-3-1 against them. Who knows? But um, I'm not, I, as a joke, I said that it's the Cowboys here because, you know, you hear it from every single Cowboys fan. They're delusional. But at the same time, they're playing really well. So I'm going to take them easily over the Colts. Um, not much to it. If Zeke gets moving, it's an easy game for him. It's always the Cowboys year until they hit the playoffs and then their first round exit. Our final game, Monday Night Football, an NFC South matchup that probably would have been good around this time last year. Not really looking forward to it this year, however. Saints, Buccaneers, Spencer to round the picks out. Who are you taking? Yeah, this is a lame Monday Night Football game. I won't lie, but... You know what, like I said previously, I'm not betting against Tom Brady. Will Wilson and I are traveling down to Florida to watch Tom Brady beat the Saints this week. Let's do it, baby. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to disagree with you here. Uh, I'm actually taking in, uh, Saints in this one. Uh, obviously, their QB situation's just kind of been a little bit of a juggle all year long here. But um, whenever it comes down to these two teams playing, the Saints kind of have Tom Brady's number. So I think if they could pull one out here – in the middle of the season, kind of shake up the division for the 300th time, it seems, this year. Um, something crazy can happen, so give me the Saints. So we have 15 games this week, and you guys have seven different picks this week. The Cardinals and Panthers are on a bye, so unfortunately, we won't be seeing those two teams play. But nonetheless, great time picking games with you boys. And next week, we'll be back with another Pick'em segment, our final Pick'em segment of the first semester here on Please Your Case. You're watching WCTV, where we aim to bring you the best local coverage of what you care about most. Everything from local businesses to hometown sports and the latest weather. We're keeping up to date with what you need to know about issues that affect our campus and our community. We're telling the stories that matter, celebrating our past, our future, and our potential. So tune in for all the latest buzz right here on WCTV Channel 14, Waynesburg. The NFL draft can be a tricky situation to put a collective team together where the talent may not translate from the college levels to the NFL. Carter, we'll start with you. Who do you think is the biggest bust of all time in the National Football League and why? Well, to me, it's very, very simple, Austin, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because here's the deal. Tony Mandrich, this man was an offensive lineman. First off, they don't get any recognition at all. Not enough. And this man was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and it was titled The Incredible Bulk. He was the second overall pick in the 1989 NFL Draft by the Green Bay Packers. And guess what? He only played in the league until 1991. Complete bust. He admitted to steroid use. And to make things worse, Barry Sanders one pick after him. Imagine pairing Barry Sanders with Brett Favre for 15 years. Would have been pretty incredible. Kayla? 
For me, we need to talk about the most hated man in Saints history. So that's Russell Erksleben, and he wasn't the 11th overall pick in the 1979 NFL draft. So we're going way back. He was drafted as a punter, and they thought he could kick and punt, but apparently he could not. He was averaging 40 yards per punt and making 50% of his field goals. And be after that, he also had, you know, a lot of the entertainment drama with prison and Ponzi schemes and all of the above and is currently in prison. Seems like a waste of a pick there. <laughs> that's pretty good. That's, kind of hard that's, to top. that's, that's a tough one to top. I mean, I'll take, I'll take my best shot unless you want to go ahead and go first, but I'm going to go Charles Rogers, okay. Michigan State. Another Michigan State guy, Tony Randrich, also went to uh, go green. But Charles Rogers, second pick in the 2003 NFL draft for the Detroit Lions. They have a pretty bad history of drafting there. We'll get in more into that. But they play, he played just 14 career NFL games. That's not even a full season. Uh, he, a lot of reasons for this. Drug use, he had a lot of injuries, he had some rests. He was out of the league very quickly and just a complete waste of a pick for a Lions franchise I don't think has really recovered since. The easiest pick to bust in the NFL, the easiest position, is a quarterback. And if you can't tell, look at the likes of Ryan Leaf with Peyton Manning in the same draft, Jamarcus Russell with Oakland, Johnny Manziel, Johnny Football, Money Manziel, Texas A&M did not work for the Cleveland Browns. How about David Carr? He was sacked, I had to check this like four or five times, and I still don't even know if it's true. He was sacked 76 times as a rookie? Is that like, that is absolutely insane. He was sacked 248 times overall in his career, which Ben Roethlisberger's taken a lot of hits, as well as Tom Brady. I don't think anybody's taken as big of a beating as David Carr. Yeah. Derek Carr, his brother, a lot better fortunes for the Raiders, but... Two other names that I look at that are from that are not quarterbacks. Brian Bosworth going to Seattle ended up being supplemental draft. A lot of things went on with Bosworth. Um, he was just a huge personality that did not work out. And Kajana Carter was the number one overall pick from Penn State in the 1995 draft. Went to the Cincinnati Bengals. And just a career that was ravaged by injuries and just was not even able to get off the ground from the very beginning. No, he was not. And there's a lot of struggles in terms of looking at quarterbacks being drafted. That's one of the hardest picks to, your positions to pick in the NFL draft. I mean, I already mentioned for the Lions, I, I mentioned uh, Charles Rogers in that time frame. Well, the quarterback thrown him during those days is another Oregon quarterback. Joey Harrington also struggled big time for the Lions. I mean, the list can go on and on. I mean, you can go Johnny Manziel, Ryan Leaf, you know, all, all sorts of quarterbacks. It's the hardest position to draft in, in professional football, I believe. I think with David Carr, though, we should go back to him. And I don't know if he was a bust or rather it was the franchise that failed him. You know, there wasn't enough offensive linemen maybe around him that were strong enough to, you know, protect him. And I don't think a team has failed their top pick so badly. And he also suffered back injuries within his fourth season that, you know, ended his whole career. And that's unfortunate. Well, the Texans were also a completely new franchise as well. So that didn't help any of his fortunes. It's just seeing how not everybody can be the Vegas Golden Knights and go to the Stanley Cup final in their first year or so. How about Carter, some Steelers busts from recent years? Okay, I got a couple for you. Okay. Do you remember Shenquez Golson? Do you remember who I know, I know, I know the name, was? but I could not tell you one play he made for the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know why? He was never that? hit the field. He didn't play one snap. He was a second-round pick from Ole Miss. Injuries completely derailed his career, and he never played. Artie Burns from Miami was thought to be maybe a second, third-round pick. Seemed like a reach for the Steelers. He didn't pan out. Went to Chicago. Haven't really heard much from him since. Also, Jarvis Jones, the Georgia outside linebacker that honestly didn't do too bad to begin his career, but then also fell off, and he has not been in the NFL for a number of years. Dre Archer was, I believe, a fourth-round pick. He had some troubles off the field as well, and was kind of used as a returner. And how about Mike Adams, the offensive tackle from Ohio State, another pick for the Steelers that did not work out. Something that always I come back to as, you know, from Pittsburgh, and a lot of people do, the 1983 draft as Gabe Rivera was the pick instead of Dan Marino (laughs) from Pitt. Steelers now trying to right that wrong with Kenny Pickett. Yeah, you, you kind of went on a stretch there of defensive backs, the Steelers. They, they, as, much, as much as Mike Tomlin is defensive backs coach, his, his heritage is in the secondary, right? They really, really struggled drafting defensive backs. Another one that it doesn't, you wouldn't be considered a bust now, but people forget how close he was to being a huge bust for them as well was Bud Dupree. He was not good the first three or four years until it was time for him to make some money in the league. Then he decided it seemed like the play. But, you know, the, the, the draft record as of late has not been fantastic. 
And especially now, Kaylin, we're seeing about five quarterbacks sometimes be picked in the first round. Josh Rosen, to me, is oh, one yeah. of those busts, which is kind of sad. I thought Rosen had potential. The Cardinals ended up picking Kyler Murray with the first pick. They gave Rosen one year. That's like if the Steelers went and selected Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud right now and just rode Kenny Pickett off into the sunset, never gave him a chance again. Josh Rosen, I think, got the short end of the stick, but at this point he's been playing on four or five different teams. Is there anybody else that comes to your mind? Um, I, I have to say Jamarcus Russell. You know, he's one of the obvious, but he had all the physical traits, but there wasn't a lot of the mental and the discipline that – went along with being a franchise quarterback. And, you know, I'm a Carolina girl at heart, and I've just moved to Pittsburgh area, and we see Mitch Trub uh, Trubisky, and he kind of reminds me of, like, Jamar Jamarcus Russell. I don't know if he has exactly what it takes to be a franchise quarterback, per se. I think he's a great player, but, you know, he's kind of following in those footsteps, in my opinion. Well, two players who are not busts in their respective sports, Sidney Crosby and Alex Ovechkin, We'll get into who we think the better player is between the two, and maybe it's do championships tell the story. Find out next on Plead Your Case. The NHL season is in full swing as Sidney Crosby and Alex Ovechkin look to try to cement their legacies even more in the National Hockey League. Now, it is time to debate who our panelists think is the better player overall. Who has had the better career between Crosby and Ovechkin? Three Stanley Cups for Sidney Crosby, one Stanley Cup for Alex Ovechkin. But do the championships tell the story, Carter, or is there something that we do not want to overlook in the overall green screen of these two performers. As Sidney Crosby, I might add, in 150 games less than Ovechkin, has seven more points. Look, you can say about points, but we'll talk about this first. So most of Sidney Crosby's points are second assists, by the way. We're just, we'll, we'll start it out there now so you can already kind of see what side I'm on. But I'm going assist Alex. Assist. It, whatever. Alex Ovechkin, 791 goals to Crosby's 528. I don't care that he played two less years than, or two more years than Sidney Crosby. He's a more physical player. He's an absolute weapon on the ice, and he knows how to put the puck in the net. He's only he's third all time right now in goal scored. He's only 10 behind Gordie Howe for second place, and the guy in first place couldn't lift the puck off the ice. Right, but the question isn't who's the best goal scorer. It's who's the best player overall. Hey, when does that swing your thoughts at all? So, Austin, to go back to what you said, when looking at the regular season stats, I will say that both of these players are great in their own niche and have their own specialty skills that they are good at. But Sidney Crosby has won three Stanley Cups versus Ovi's one. You know, and that goes that says a lot towards Crosby's career. So I'm going to have to go with Sidney Crosby as the best overall impressive player. When Sidney Crosby was 19, Carter, he had 120 points and 84 total assists, which is a pretty mind-blowing stat. Overall for Crosby, 528 goals, 910 assists. On the other side for Alex Ovechkin, 791 goals, as you mentioned, as well as 640 assists. But when you look at the overall plus-minus, Crosby is plus 202. Alex Ovechkin is plus 69 overall. Sidney Crosby... The team is just better and is able to do a better job just overall to be able to put points on the board and put goals on the board, rather, and be able to collect points and really be able to carry the Penguins. As nice as a plus-minus stat line is, the Pittsburgh Penguins have a much better team in terms of overall. 
I mean, look at his second line center. It's it's Geno Malkin, man. I mean, one of the best players of all time, as well as Sidney Crosby. So I, I think the team statistics, and you want to go plus minus. I know Malkin and Crosby don't play in the same line, but he, the, the amount of talent around them, I think it doesn't compare. Sidney Crosby has a much better team. This is also kind of another thing. Is Ovi has to do all the scoring for the for the Washington Capitals? It feels like. He's, he's really their only player that seems like, like year in, year out can put the puck They've in the back They've had of players. T.J. Oshie, Nick Backstrom. That's just a couple who have been in a long line of Washington Man. Capitals players. But at the same time, Kalen, if Crosby did not have the concussions and the other various injuries, because Alex Ovechkin, in his first 14 years, played at least 68 games in all but one. Crosby had the injuries that hampered him in his mid-20s to the point where now – He's also playing complete seasons. Crosby has only played 82 games once. Yeah, you know, Crosby is a younger player. He has played less games, and he is still the main stat sheet stuffer. When looking at matchups between the two of these players, the Penguins superstar has 23 more points over Ovi in career head-to-head matchups. So... He's got the better team, that's all i got to say. Better team. When the Penguins won the Stanley Cup in 2016 and 2017, the Penguins had to go through the Capitals in the second round of the playoffs to win. They were able to beat the Capitals. And how about when Washington won it the following year, the Capitals had to go through the Penguins. So it's a great rivalry back and forth. Crosby overall, in a way, has taken it from Ovechkin, but Ovechkin, one of the best goal scorers of all time. Crosby, arguably a top 10, top 5 player of all time, definitely joining Ovechkin in those ranks. But for Kaylin Elian and Carter Newcomb and everybody in our entire crew of Logan Episcopal, our producer, I'm Austin Vexel saying so long and thank you for watching Plead Your Case. Have a great night. This has been a production of Waynesburg Community Television.